According to Barna, 64% of Christians today think that evangelism is optional. Let's change the stats. Welcome to GoCast, a podcast designed to inspire and equip pastors and leaders to lead soul-winning churches. We have a mission to go and make disciples. This is GoCast. Hey everyone, welcome to GoCast. I'm your host, Kelly Stickle, and I'm joined as always by my friend and co-host, Tim Tribble. Hey, Tim, how are you doing today, man? I'm well, Kelly, thanks. Awesome, awesome. Well, today we've got an amazing conversation with my friend, good friend, Pastor Jaken Mullen from yeah. Home Church in Red Deer, Alberta. And Jaken talks about in this conversation, uh, you know, how the transition worked between taking over his dad's church, who was the founder uh, and pastor for, for many years, of the church, and he recently took over from his dad, and how that transition went, and mm-hmm. the heart that his dad had in in transitioning that, and what it took for Jaken to do that. But he also talked about how he never wanted to be a pastor, right. and, and yet he's doing an amazing job and blowing it up. So let me ask you a question: Yeah, have you always wanted to be in ministry? I, I hear this over and over again, and a lot of it is from PK kids that end up growing up to be pastors. Yeah, and, and there was never, you know. Growing up, there was never a desire for me to ever do it. My dad was even a pastor before, uh, you know, in my younger years. And then um, I just never had a desire for it. But I think that God uses our past to groom us for our, for our present and our future. And um, we grew up, I grew up in a foster home where yeah. we always had broken kids. They were disconnected from their families, uh, rejected and everything like that. And I think God kind of used that to build a heart for me for, for ministry. And then, um, I don't know, God wow. had a plan and he just kind of leads and directs in the way. It's, yeah, it's a call. It really is. Uh, I don't know, when you want to do ministry, there's something, it's it's too hard to just be a, a vocation or to want to do it. There has to be a call that goes with yes. it. I know for me, the uh, reason why Pastor Jake and I are, are good friends and we connect out, of, he's probably one of my best friends in, in ministry. Mm-hmm. We connect because I was a musician, he was a musician, right. both of us had focused on that, didn't want to pastor, and we ended up pastoring. He transitioned from his dad in the, in the similar time that I took over uh, the church here in Lethbridge, so yeah. we went through a lot of those similar things. But there's a lot that happens in this conversation that is really going to be helpful to pastors. Can't wait to get to it. Mm-hmm. He talks about not just the transition, but he also talks about some of the special ministries and outreaches that they're doing from their church that are profoundly impacting yes. their community and their church. You're not going to want to miss this conversation, so let's go to it right now. My my conversation with Pastor Jake and Mullen of Home Church in Red Deer, Alberta. Hey, Jake, and so great to have you on the podcast. Welcome to GoCast, my friend. It's great to have you. Love it. So glad to be here. I'm excited about uh, GoCast and seeing lots of people come to Christ, even through the ideas that come out through this, and can't wait to hear all the podcasts coming. Yeah, it's gonna be. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we're having lots of fun. So, man, you you've got quite the the track record, man. You, you, we've known each other for a while now, and uh, your your background is pretty spectacular. You're uh, a worship leader extraordinaire. Wrote songs, had them had them uh, published, and and we're kind of on fast track in in music, in in Christian music, and all the rest of it. And then all of a sudden, now you're you're pastoring. So, man, how did how did that come about? Well, that's, it's quite a long story, but um, to give you the, the short version is I, I grew up a pastor's kid yeah. and never wanted to be a lead pastor. That was the worst thing I could possibly think of being yeah. uh, growing up, but loved God, loved church, loved my parents, loved um, what was going on, but just didn't have that in my own spirit, um, ended up uh at the age of 17 meeting a man of god that was um a songwriter and he put his arm around me and said you should write songs and i felt an impartation uh it wasn't like an altar call experience but like something happened there where yeah um this really great songwriter said you should write songs the next song that i wrote actually became a top 10 ccli song <laughs> uh, it's called i stand in awe i stand in awe yeah um which um it was funny because I'd never written a song or didn't know how to write a song. And I, I really believe that like God would download these songs to me Yeah. as a young man in 17, 18, 19. And then for the next about 16 years, I uh, wrote songs, uh, many that were published through integrity and Maranatha and other songwriters and worship leaders. And I uh, did a bunch of my own and 
And then uh, there came a point where I was coming home. I was kind of half on the road and half at home, and I'd come home and I'd see our youth group. And at that time, it was like 10 kids going on a bus, bowling, you know, but there was like no spiritual life attached to it. Yeah. And it just bothered me to the point where I went to my dad and I said, if you, if you want me to, my dad was the founding pastor of our church. If you would like me to take the youth ministry, I'll take it on. And little did I know that that was actually probably the proving ground for, for even greater leadership. And so over the next three years, we took that 10 kids from 10 young people to about 250 young people Wow! on, uh, on Saturday nights. And it was all young people coming to Christ uh, in that little season of, of time. Wow. And, you know, it was kind of like, uh, didn't realize that I was sharpening, you know, it was like, it was like kind of the first opportunity to preach, right? On a regular, like you're regularly preaching. And of course, when you're preaching with youth, it's not always, um, you know, the most meaty material, uh, but you're getting to preach, you're, you're learning how to lead. And that's really was my proving ground until my, uh, my dad, who is the founding pastor of our church, asked me if I would take leadership of our Red Deer campus, which is kind of our hub campus for yeah. other campus, other locations. And at that time, I was like, no way. I had promised my wife before we got married we weren't going to be pastors like that, <laughs> like lead pastors. Um, and I had said, never, never, never. And so I said no at least six times. Wow. Until one night I woke up in the middle of the night and literally as I, I was putting my foot off the bed, the Lord said to me, next time he asks, say yes. Wow. And so I waited until he said yes. And in between that time, there was a whole bunch of change in the church, staff change. And I thought, man, when I take, when, when I do say yes, this church is going to fall apart. Because <laughs> everything is changing so fast, and the changes that I knew I wanted to make uh, in the church, I thought, man, that our church isn't going to be able to handle this. Um, and so finally, my dad asked again uh, a few months later, and and I said, well, the Lord spoke to me and said, next time he asked, say yes. And of course, my wife was in a hundred percent agreement. Yeah, uh, God had spoken to her as well, um, and we ended up taking leadership of a church that was, uh, at that time, um, you know, uh, a charismatic church, a wonderful church, wonderful people. At the same time, the reality was very few people were coming to Christ. Right. It was not somewhere you'd wanted to bring a friend and, um, uh, people were friendly, but there was things going on during a service that you just wouldn't want your friend. You would have to like, explain for five hours what just happened yeah so your so word of life church in in red deers has been um in those times one of the most influential uh churches in western canada if not in canada um it was a conference church like all the it hosted all these big conferences lots of churches around canada look uh to your your parents and to and to your church for leadership yet was it, it's almost 10 years ago right that you you took over It'll be 10 years this month. Wow. Yeah. So 10 years ago, you took over Word of Life Church, very charismatic church, very conference-driven church. It is now home church in, in Red Deer. And there's been, I mean, tell us a little bit about, because there's been some major, major changes, uh, lots of similarities, but some major changes, that, and the church is now uh, growing faster and larger than it's ever been. So tell us about some of the, the changes that came about. Well, to give you a little bit of a, a wider picture to begin with, I want to I want to honor my father, mm -hmm. and because before he gave the church to me, there was actually a day where we were a conference church, and what really actually kind of got bothersome was that the conference was different than our church. Like our church actually was trying, starting to try to reach people, but then you'd go to the conference and it didn't have that same feel. So you had these different cultures that were colliding. Right at that time, and one day um, I got a call from my dad. It was uh, it was uh, eight o'clock in the morning. All the staff were meeting, 
this morning in my office. That had never happened where we got a call like that. And so, of course, you know, you're driving to the church and you're thinking, what is going on? Like something, something's going on that we were mm. meeting uncalled for that day. And I walked by my dad's office and there it was silence. I was the last person to the meeting. Musician, last person to the meeting. And a uh, <laughs> little, little bit late. <laughs> and, uh, and so, last person to the meeting and it's, there's silence. And I look through the door and my dad is crying. Mm. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like, you know, all these thoughts are going through my head. Like, did my dad have an affair? What's going on? What's happening? I walk in and it, thank God it wasn't any of those things. Um, but my dad um, says, he's just weeping. And he says, the Lord spoke to me and said that um, we've been building a church for my generation. And now we need to build a church for the next generation and we need to reach people for Christ. Wow. And, you know, that's coming from someone who had been at that time in the ministry for probably 35 plus years. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, that, that was, I believe, the day that our church started to turn. Um, and then probably, you know, probably what was in my heart got used to just turn the boat even that much more so you know some of those things were aesthetic and some of those things were heart yeah so like we're, we were we had a church with green pews green uh green carpet uh fuchsia pink background giant flowers in front of the pulpit i remember it was uh you know <laughs> flags on every all around the building and all that uh and you know to the first some of the first changes were aesthetic changes of removing those pews, putting in chairs, putting up, you know, some better lighting, uh, you know, painting over that pink, um, putting up signage that reflected the values of our church and the, yeah. and the heartbeat of our church. And we actually started with a line that I wrote out in a, on a napkin in Starbucks one day, which was everyone needs Jesus. Everyone needs a home. Yeah. And that became the, the heartbeat of our house. And, and then we just started, I started just to declare some things to, to our church that we were going to be a soul, re, soul winning church and that yeah. we're going to come to Christ. And, and, uh, and so just service by service, we started to see, um, you know, all of a sudden it was like, you know, three people come to Christ in one Sunday, <laughs> you know, that was a big deal. Yeah back in those days and and then five and then 10 and then 20. And I remember one weekend I said, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a kind of a, a weekend that was all about reaching people for Christ. It was called life nights. And I said, wouldn't it be amazing if a hundred people came to Christ on this Friday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Sunday, and that weekend, 101 people gave their lives to Christ wow. on one weekend. And so, you know, our church, which, our Red Deer location at that point was 380 people. The first Sunday that we took over, yeah, soon soon was growing. I mean, we probably, you know, were 500 within a year, yeah. 700 within a couple of years, and then over a thousand. Uh, you know, probably five years in. I, I yeah. can't remember all the dates and times. I'm totally <laughs> throwing out. So <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, 1,200, and and then you know we start doing huge events where. We would have, you know, 1,600, 1,800. Yeah. Um, this year at our Christmas experience, I think we had 2,700 people. So awesome. Christmas experience. And so I think it's a combination of, of uh, out, outreach or ways to reach people that are specific opportunities, but it's also every Sunday is an opportunity. Yeah, so good. And we, we never miss one Sunday where people don't have an opportunity to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And in 10 years, uh, I only remember, I only, and I, I have a very good memory of this because it's so, soul winning is so on my heart. There's only one Sunday when no one came to Christ. Wow. That was at the very beginning. It was the first month. That's amazing. But every week. Um, so like this weekend, I think there was 14 or 15 uh, this last weekend, uh, which is a little bit low, but it is the summertime. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way it is for us. But, but 
you know, it's very common for us to have 15 to 25 people coming to Christ every single week. Every week. That's amazing. You said so much in that stretch of that that was really powerful, but I, I too want to just commend your 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 dad. He's an amazing man, amazing pastor, amazing leader, uh, has an amazing heart. And um, I think it's really, really key what you said right there, because there might be pastors listening and saying, man, I, you know, what do I do to start, you know, to get soul winning? I think it just starts with, yeah, God breaking your heart and saying, we have to reach the next generation. We have to reach souls. And and watching and and you know when he said that, I think everybody on the team, I'm sure uh, you yourself as well, didn't have a, an idea of what was coming or how to do each yeah. step along the way. It you don't get all the hows immediately. You don't change all the decor immediately, um, but it starts with that heart desire. Well, Kelly, even to take that one step further, because I appreciate everything that you just said. Um, to take it one step forward farther than that so he's weeping in this meeting and he says we're, this is what we're going to do his very next sentence was what do i need to do to change wow and that that honestly just even remembering that right now just almost brings a tear to my eye because that that is a real picture of a humble leader yeah and he actually looked at me and asked me i was the first person that asked now wow to be honest i had my list <laughs> and not that I, I had like a whole bunch of like criticisms, but I had things that as a church, I wanted to see us do. And we already, before I took leadership of the church, started processing a lot of those yeah. small things sometimes that make a huge difference uh, just in the culture of an atmosphere of a church, creating a warm and friendly environment, a place that People can, uh, people know yeah. that hey, they're going to get a handshake and a connection and a high five. And so we started talking through the language that we use on Sundays. We started yeah. talking through what the welcome would look like. We started talking to what would we give to get guests as gifts. Um, all sorts of things because you can't change everything at once. Um, no, you know it's a financial commitment to change things. It's. Uh, you know, it's a, there's a learning process involved. Uh, but just to say that, that the first thing he said was, what do I need to change? I think that's what every leader needs to look at right off the beginning is what can I change? What can I do differently? And to be humble enough to ask a few people around us, what could I change that would make a huge difference? Uh, that's so key because oftentimes, yeah, it's us that as leaders that get in the way of of the results that we want. We don't like to, to look in the mirror a lot of times in that way, but a lot of times uh, it, it's us. At, you know, Acts 15, I think the realization for, for the early church was they had that big meeting and going, you know, how, what rules do we keep and what rules do we not keep? And then I, I love what James, his statement there in Acts 15, 19 says, hey, let us not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are coming to Christ. Right, right. The the ownership wasn't on you know God's not bringing this in or that's not our God. He, it, it was like let us as a leader. And so, man, I so appreciate that. I so appreciate your your dad's heart in that and and your heart in that too. Because I mean, it, everything didn't change immediately, like you said, but there was a process, and that's so 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 good. So tell me about tell me about somebody, uh, a testimony, a recent one or not recent one, but one that stands out to you about someone who came to Christ that in an unusual circumstances or, you know, comes from a, a rough background who normally wouldn't come into a church, but somehow came to church because of, of what you're doing now in, in the church. Totally. Well, let me just say that I, I really believe that we all need to take responsibility for seeing our church be a soul winning church. Yeah. And as a pastor, I take that into my own life. And so let me just take you around my block because Beck and I have been trying to sell our house for like two years and for every reason we can't sell it. The Lord keeps like putting on our hearts. Well, there must be people on our block that need Christ. And so it actually started with the neighbor right beside me. Yeah. His name is Mike. And um, Mike was, uh, when I first moved into our house, I didn't like him at all. <laughs> he was like really loud, straightforward, a little too straightforward. And I walked in our house and I said to my wife, I don't think I can live beside this guy. Yeah, plus he's an Oilers fan. So there's plus that. Too. He's an Oilers fan. <laughs> Obnoxious Oilers fan. <laughs> but I love him. 
today. He's actually one of my best friends today. Yeah. Um, and actually, over the next three years, we we prayed for for Mike and his family to come to the Lord. And uh, there was many times that you know we would give we gave them Bibles at Christmas, and then thought, man, why did we give them a religious present and stuff like this? But it was actually after he gave his life to the Lord that we opened up that same Bible that he wow. kept and started him in the book of John. Um, but Mike, uh, Mike was this awesome guy. And it was actually on the way to an Oilers game. I said to my wife, I said, I said, babe, I'm not going to talk to Mike about Jesus today because I kind of felt like I was pushing it too much. Right. And she says, she said to me, she said, well, you don't have to talk to him about Jesus, but if he brings it up, you have the responsibility. And I was like, oh, I just want to go to the Oilers game <laughs> <laughs> and watch them lose, which they did. And uh, so, <laughs> no joke, we get into our vehicle, we get to the end of the street, and Mike says to me, Jaken is my daughter in heaven. Wow. And they had lost their daughter um, just as a baby. Mm. And the rest of the trip all the way there and all the way back we talked he i kept asking these questions like is my daughter in heaven of course i was able to say well my i i believe your daughter didn't have an opportunity to receive christ i believe heaven is full of babies yes and um we had this beautiful conversation it was about three months after that we didn't know this and and uh, mike would tell this testimony if he was right here with me but we didn't know they were their marriage was on the edge Mm. falling apart um mike was uh drinking uncontrollably uh putting so much money into alcohol that it was they're on the edge of financial trouble and uh and i'm driving home from church i get into my into my garage and carolyn phones and she's weeping on the phone and i can't Mm. even tell what she's saying and she says would you please come over mike was drunk last night and said he needs to talk to you. I said, yeah, I'll be right over. So that day, um, Mike was upstairs. He was hung over. He was still in bed. He had a quick shower. He came down to the table and we went through Romans road together, wow. uh, held hands across the table, uh, his wife, Caroline, Carolyn and Mike and I, and led Mike to Christ. So cool. Uh, that's one neighbor. Uh, wasn't too much longer there was actually a neighbor about three houses down from that we came across and saw like a home church you know invitation on their car oh man who is this somebody's been coming to our church on our block because we (laughs) walk our block and pray for our block to come to christ you know yeah and uh and so that was a it was a young teenage girl she gave her life to christ her parents started coming to church her grandma started to come to church um just recently there's a a uh, couple, Travis and Melissa, they're three doors down from us on the same side as Mike. And Travis said he would never come to church. And my wife started hanging out with Melissa and sharing the Lord with her. She she came to church, brought their kids without Travis. And uh, then her kids wanted to get baptized through the kids program. And they'd both given their lives to Christ. So they get baptized. Travis comes to church. And to be honest with you, I don't 100% know if Travis is committed to Christ. Like, like I don't know if he's ever said the prayer because I've never seen his hand go up. Yeah, yeah. But he sits with, but he sits with us every Sunday in the front row. <laughs> and he's definitely on the journey. Yeah. Long till you believe. And uh, and and then we got a uh, another neighbor, uh, and and she's a single mom, two kids. They're always over playing with our kids and stuff and her mom comes over to our house and says you know keep inviting her to church because you know i'm a believer and she comes and whispers to us i don't know why she whispers because <laughs> yeah. um and, and then we got neighbors on the other side that uh, we're bringing their son to church with us sometimes wow. and believing for them and i really believe it starts with your block your business the people that you work with your friends your family and we're all responsible for this like this isn't the church's responsibility you know it's our responsibility as the church to be a part of bringing people to god's house and in doing that and for me as a pastor setting that example uh and that's just one story i could 
I could, I got, you know, a few more people if you really want. Yeah, to. absolutely. No, that's awesome. I mean, it's true. Like when you, when you as a pastor, you, you're passionate about the souls and you set the example for your church, man, that's inspiring for everybody else, man. Your pastor's not just saying it, he's, he's doing it as well. And, and you wouldn't classify your main gift as, as an evangelist, would you? Actually, I probably would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, it's probably the, probably the strongest out of like the five full gifts. Yeah. That would be my strongest gift. Um, I love it. I love seeing people come to Christ and, um, you know, so you're very, you're very much a relational, uh, evangelist in that regard too, right? I mean, it's all comes through relationship and very, very natural. You're very natural that way too. So yeah, that's, that's really cool. T- talk to me about, so you just did a block party that was off the, off the chains. That was uh, amazing. So you do these block parties every summer and have been for, for a number of years. And, and so tell us, just kind of walk us through what, what is a block party and how does it work and, and what kind of impact does it have on the church? So the idea of a block party actually came from Matthew Barnett and the Dream Center in Los Angeles. Yeah. But they, their block parties, you know, they're in the hood and uh, that doesn't really translate to uh, Red Deer. And so <laughs> man, when I saw and heard of their block parties, I just thought, man, what could we do in Red Deer? And we started to pray and think and strategize for that. And so we just decided we're going to do a block party and start a bus ministry. And we had no idea what we were going to do. We bought an old school bus and we bought, uh, we took an offering, bought a, a school, old school bus for, I think, 1200 bucks. And we bought one jump house and wow. we had some borrowed barbecues and we cooked hot dogs for people. And wow. our first block party, I think, might have had 100 guests. And that Sunday, 12 people came on the bus. Wow. And I just like, honestly, I stood there welcoming them to church. Tears in my eyes. These people came in, gave their lives to Christ. And now, you know, our our bus ministry has grown to where we bring in about 100 people every week to church. On buses? On buses. Wow. A lot of single moms and kids. Yeah. And, uh, And there's probably... 300 people in our church today that have come through the block, block, or block parties and buses, bus ministry, um, that, you know, have now through God's word and teaching have, you know, gotten better employment and now have their own vehicle and now their marriages are restored and their families are doing better. And, and now they're, you, they're not on the bus anymore. That's the whole point. Right. Um, Uh, but it's just uh, that first day was a, a huge day. And so we just tried something. And I actually remember the night before we were doing it, because, like, I mean, I, we had taken an offering. We had, you know, said to our church, like, how are we going to reach the community and all this? And I'm thinking, what if nobody comes to this block party? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This would be horrible, which was very possible. And we got there, and there was like 100 people there. Wow. My mom actually said to me when I called her that day, she said, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm a little concerned, you know, like, what if nobody comes? And then the church is like, you know, why did we invest into this yeah. stuff? Yeah. And, uh, and she said to me these words that just still ring in me, you know, you do the work, God will provide the fruit. Wow. And... So I'm really into taking risks like that, that, you know, sometimes we see more fruit than other times. And so we've been doing that, uh, you know, ever since, um, that's probably six years ago. Yeah. And this year, what we decided to do was to do two massive block parties. Right. Where we're canvassing our whole city over the summer. So it's, you know, sometimes like you see people go to their door and, you know, like you think, you know, I'm going to tell someone about Jesus at the door. And it's like, I don't want, I do not want to do that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do not want to have conversations like that. Well, instead what we do is we go to the door with a door hanger, knock on the door and we say, Hey, would you like to come to a block party? Our church is putting it on free hot dogs, free snow cones, free drinks, free bouncy houses for the kids, free activities for youth. It's going to wow. be a blast. And people love it, respond, and our church loved to take that first step of just knocking on a door and inviting someone to a community event. 
And so well, that's so cool because I mean, for you start, you you help out kids and you minister to kids. I mean, parents are they're going to follow their kids. So uh, you do something like with the bouncy houses and all the all the snow cones and all the kind of stuff for the kids. Man, the the parents the parents are going to get excited about that too. And if their kids have fun, yep. man, their kids are going to want to to go back to something. So that's that's really cool. Totally. And and now after doing it year after year. Uh, you go to the door and, oh, yeah, we took our kids two years ago. We couldn't go last year, but we'll be there this time, you know? Yeah. And people are also getting an invitation to church as well. Um, but this this uh, one we had last week, we had 500 guests, over 500 guests. Wow. For that block party. It was a stormy night. Yeah. The storm quit right before the block party started. And so I'm sure we would have even had more um, if not, but. You know, we got to canvas our community and then do this huge blog party. They're great opportunities to just be face to face with people, connect with people. And then when they come to the blog party, um, all of our teams are just ready to be welcoming, serve people, love people, connect with people, get to know their names. And we usually use like, you know, so if it's where it was this time in Inglewood, which is where I live, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the people from Inglewood, it's so easy that that are in our church, which we have a pile from Inglewood. Yeah. Like make sure that you tell people, hey, I live in Inglewood and I go to home church. Would you join us on Sunday? Wow. And uh, so, how, so you, you told me off air uh, that you, you expect a couple hundred people a summer to come, to come into the church because of these block parties. Totally. That's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and usually it happens over a, uh, you know, it doesn't happen on one Sunday. It usually happens over the summer and then through into the September. Right. And so, you know, we put a door knocker on each home in our city this summer. And then when September comes, they'll also get a, uh, another card that invites them back to church. Right. And through those follow-up kind of events that keep happening, you know, you just find people open. Like, you know, you're at Costco and you meet someone and you start talking to them and they say, well, where, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm the pastor at home church. Oh, I just got that flyer on my door. Looked really cool. Like we couldn't come, but we're, I've been really thinking about coming to your wow. church. And so sometimes it's like those things have an impact. There was one time, um, you know, we, we put cards on, on doors and, and, um, there was a lady that, um, was at a soccer game. It was my son, Levi was like seven years old. He's playing soccer. Yeah, I of course, me. I'm running the sidelines, yelling at the kids. <laughs> go 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 go! You know, I'm just like screaming at the kids, laughing, having a good time. Yeah. And this lady says to to my wife, "Hey, is that the pastor at home church?" <laughs> I I've had his I've had the card on my fridge for over a year, thinking of coming. Wow! And she ended up coming to church. And, and actually, one of the words she said was, he seems so real. Because <laughs> I was out there <laughs> running with the kids. <laughs> yeah. She ended up coming to church and giving her life to Christ. That's awesome. And so some of these things you see over a period of time, and then you go, wow, holy smokes, there's there's a couple hundred people that came in through the summer. That's really cool. And uh, these these are, I mean, that's a great idea for any church in any community is to do these bridge events, like a block party or, yep. or something for the kids in the community or for the community as a, as a whole. And just to create, uh, yeah, a bridge to the church where somebody, somebody might not walk through the front doors of a church until they meet the people in the church and go, these are normal people. These these are, they seem like real people. And, and that's somebody that I wouldn't mind hanging around with. That's really cool. And, you know, just another thought too, uh, Pastor Kelly is, you know, sometimes like we think of the financial side and it's like, oh, how could I do all that? But we started with one jump house yeah. and a re rented grill. And the next year we took another offering. We bought another jump house. Yeah. The next year we took another offering. We bought a huge youth jump house that was giant, you know, maze. Yeah. yeah. The, then we bought, other stuff that we bought a truck and a trailer the next year. And so over like a five year time, now when you drive into that community, you can't miss the block party. Yeah. That's cool. And it's like a five year plan. It's like, it doesn't, it's not like you're having to do everything in one shot one year. Yeah. That's so good. 
So good, man. This has been so good and so helpful for our listeners. I know they've been enjoying. Is there anything that that I uh, you wish I would have asked you? Well, you know, just talking about community events, like some of these things, like I think it begins with a dream. Yeah. And so for us, like we said uh, a few years ago, I said, I said to my st- our staff, I said, you know, I have a dream. I have a dream that in three years, when people think about Christmas, they'll think about our church. Yeah. And so we started something called the Christmas Experience. Yeah. And basically, we give free sleigh rides, free hot chocolate. Um, you know, have like a winter wonderland outside of our church property. Yeah. And and that's an event now that every year now people in the church like three years later, you know, we had. 2,700 people or whatever this Christmas. Yeah. Um, every year building on it year after year after year uh, becomes a huge, uh, you know, opportunity to reach people for Christ. Uh, we do uh, Easter experience as well. Life nights, which is like kind of like a couple nights where, and it did just totally to bring friends into the house. Right. Right. Um, and so, well, Christmas is a great one uh, because, uh, you know, if you can become the place that, that people think about Christmas, Christmas families love to do traditional stuff, right? They love to do something that is, if you're going to create a memory for them one year, they're going to come back the next year uh, and you're creating, you know, you're part of their family all of a sudden, which yep. again is one more bridge into a relationship with Jesus and in the church. Totally. That's really cool. Man, I love that. So, man, this has been this has been awesome. So, where where can our listeners connect with you online? Where if somebody wants to follow you on Instagram, y- your tag is my my name is pretty. Uh, if you put my name in, it'll, you'll it'll come up right away. J a c h i n m u l l e n on Instagram. Yeah, myhomechurch.ca is our website. Uh, we also have a home church podcast as well. And, uh, and yeah, just, uh, join in. And then, you know, some, a lot of churches have asked us questions about block parties and things like yeah. that. Honestly, you could call in our office 403-343-6570. And, uh, we would, we would send you everything that we have, like all our door hangers and everything. And literally you could put your church name on it and do it. Cause we've done that for so many churches that have just asked a few questions about how to start and, We'd love to to help churches so good. reach their communities for Christ. So good. Yeah, thanks for that. That is that is awesome. And I'm sure there's lots of pastors and, and leaders that will take you up on that. So that that is great. Man, thanks so much. This has been this has been awesome, man. Thanks so much for for joining the podcast. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. Love all that you're doing at my victory. All right. Bless you, man. What a great conversation with Pastor Jakin yeah. Mullen. There's so much again in that episode of ideas and, and insight. You can just see he, and hear his his heart. What was mm-hmm. your big takeaway? I loved it. Loved it when he talked about his dad and and he came and found his dad in the office. His dad was weeping and went in and his dad had the humility to look at him and say, you know, what do I need to do to change? And I think that's a big question for a senior leader to ask himself in the in the in the stage of a transition period and having just that that ability to ask ourselves like what do we need to change in order to make the mission go further the humility in that question alone is is remarkable Astounding, yeah. i uh, have so much respect and and honor for pastor mel yeah. and that his his willingness to put the mission ahead of even his own ego and his own it was himself. It, it really is remarkable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fruit of, of that decision of that moment has, has been amazing. Yeah. And it's a challenging for all of us as leaders because, you know, sometimes we get in the way yeah. and sometimes it's us that needs to change. And sometimes us that needs to get out of the way in order to see the fruit. And man, there's so much gold in this, that amazing. conversation and in this podcast, so much we, we learn every single week, <laughs> so many ideas that we can take and apply to our churches and man, it's so exciting. So where can people connect with us and subscribe to the podcast? Yeah, absolutely. If you loved what you heard what you t- uh, today on this podcast, then you can definitely go to the GoCast website at gocast.ca or you can subscribe to us on uh, iTunes at the GoCast podcast. 
Yeah, and you can also join the conversation and follow us on Instagram, and we're on Facebook as well. We encourage you to connect with us there. We would love to have you in the conversation. Mm -hmm. We really want to move this mission forward of seeing soul-winning churches all across the world and change the statistics that are out there that the church is just existing for itself. No, we're not. We're on mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, and uh, we're going to stay on that mission and keep focused on doing that. We would love to have you join along with us. Well, we are about to hit a Christmas break, a winter break, yep. and here we are already. Isn't it amazing? I can't believe it's Christmas. And so we're going to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas, and we're going to be taking a short break from the podcast for the next uh, three weeks. We're going to be coming back on January 6th with an episode, an interview that I do with Pastor Kevin Gerald of Champion Center yeah. in Seattle, Washington. If you have not heard of Pastor Kevin, uh, he is one of the most amazing teachers out there. He's an incredible pastor, incredible leader. He uh, leads and influences some of the, you know, some of the biggest, best churches on mm. the planet. Those that you know of look to him for leadership. It's a fascinating conversation that you're not going to want to miss. It's coming January 6th. Here's an excerpt from my conversation with Pastor Kevin Gerald of Champion Center. Um, how do you define vulnerability. So I think that um, the book and the intention of the book is to give some definition and some clarity around vulnerability as as I'm describing it. And it's not only about how open I am in conversation with my stuff, my life, and so forth. But it's also what I call being willing to make a move when there's no guarantee of the outcome. Mm. Can't wait for that conversation. Again, Mm. a reminder to you that we're going to be taking a short break, a winter break here at GoCast. But we will be back on January 6th with a conversation with Pastor Kevin Gerald. Stay tuned. Can't wait to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for this episode of GoCast. We hope you feel inspired and better equipped to take your community for Christ. Make sure to subscribe to receive each new episode as it's released. Let's go and break the stat together.